with your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Even the main focus was was UBL, and it was where is he? You know, let's let's get some some idea on on where he's at, and um, you know that's what drove us to Tora Bora pretty quickly. I mean, yeah, we. we we got in there. We got in there pretty quickly. Headed that direction, and you know that was in a, a whole other adventure in itself. Yeah, yeah. And so, could you tell us about that? About getting um, whatever you're you're able to say about the initial intel that led you guys to Tora Bora, and then making the infiltration there. Yeah. So, um, again, initial intel. You know, other than just what the team leader, you know, would put out, like, "Hey, here's where we're going." Um, <laughs> you know, the, this is what they said. This is where he's at. This is where we're going. Here's the plan. So we we had sent one of our guys forward, um, and, and a lot of this is in the book, you know, Dalton Fury's book, um, Kill Bin Laden. Um, we we had some one of our guys that was working um, with the agency as an LNO. He had set up a safe house for us in JBAD. So we took, you know, did the drive to JBAD, um, driving our Toyotas, and that was oh God, that was that was horrendous. I mean, that was. 10 hours plus just driving back roads and, you know, switch backs up mountains and yeah. you're driving on roads that were barely wide enough for that Toyota. And now you're splitting the road with this big old Jenga truck that's coming the other direction. Yeah. Um, I mean, and you could see, you, you look over the edge of the mountain and you could see other trucks that, you know, had fallen off the mountain and, yeah. you know, I mean, it just, it was hairy um, <laughs> just getting there and, you know, the number of checkpoints you go through to get in there. But we, we got there, you know, in, in all during daylight, um, was the goal. So we got there in, in one period of daylight, uh, right about dark, we linked up with our LNO. He took us into J bad, brought us to the safe house. Um, you know, and even that was sketchy cause it was, there was Afghans that were guarding the safe house and mm-hmm. there were some in the safe house. And still at this point, you're like, Ooh, who's good, who's bad. You know, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, who yeah. trust you really don't. And then you got to get some sleep in this room where these guys are walking around. And, you know, so we still took shifts just internally um between you know between the element that was there um you know just somebody staying up and watching our gear and and doing whatnot even as we're in a safe house um so we stayed there that first night and then the plan was that they were going to drop a blue 82 um so they were dropping the big one right there on the mountains and then we were coming in like right behind it um so they, they did that. And I remember as we were driving up there, you know, watching, seeing the bird, all right, getting the countdown, like the comms of what's going to happen. And then they dropped it and everybody was kind of like, was that a low order? Like what? I mean, it was not as, as spectacular as we all thought. Um, we ended up, after they dropped it, we ended up spinning around, um, heading back. And I think at that point, um, we ended up having – having Dalton Fury, you know, having um, Tom had linked up through the agency with one of the local tribal chiefs and he was going to house us, take us in. Um, So we go there, we stay at his place. And again, it's the same thing. I mean, there's Afghanis all over, you know, you, you you trust them only because the agency was paying them a lot of money. Right. Um, But if somebody else came in and paid them more money, then they would have slit all our throats in the middle of the night, you know, and they didn't care. They really didn't. Um, so we ended up staging out of there and working our way into Torbor to get dropped off. We we had to make one pass going in and actually come back out because um, we had to go by this, uh, I think we called it Media Hill or Press Hill, where a lot of the press were. They were just outside of mortar range. So they're all sitting up on this hill, but that was the only way for us to get to the base of the trails in the mountain for us to start working our way up. And as we passed through there on the first attempt going in during daylight, um, a couple guys got spotted and some pictures got leaked out. And the whole thing was we didn't, we wanted, we did not want to get any U S presence. No, we were not in Torboro. We were, you know, kind of denying it. We wanted, you know, the Northern Alliance to take credit for whatever we were going to do there. Um, it's kind of part of the, part of the drug deal. So we ended up having to turn around the first attempt we made going in. And I, I, I want to say, one of the pictures that leaked out is Shrek. Um, so John McPhee in the back of one of the trucks <laughs> um, that some reporter snapped, um, you know, and of course we're dressed in all local garb and we're, you know, we're hiding, we're, our guns are hidden, you know, we're not trying to show any U S gear, nothing um, as, as we get in there, but we end up going in the second day 
Um, I think we went in like real early, early morning, trying to get there before the press, you know, really got up on the hill. And we inserted in, hung out at the base for a little bit, linked up with a couple of, of guides um, that were going to sort of take us up through some of the mountain paths and trails and, and get us to UBL, um, you know, but it was, uh, it was a little hairy getting in there and, and um, some of the other adventures that we had as we were moving through the mountain range and getting, I mean, I'll getting RPG and getting mortared and getting shot at by Dishka. I mean, it was, yeah, there were, there were some hairy times. I'm, I'm kind of surprised we got through it as, as well as we did. Um, so you were taking you know, sporadic what, fire as you went through those mountain passes. We were, um, one of the times as that we, that we were, we were up in there. Um, there was a Dishka that was sitting up on some high ground and they were shooting up, shooting at our convoy. Uh, as we were coming through, because of course it was nighttime, we had some lights on and we even had, you know, I think we had some nods and we had blackout lights on the trucks and everything, but, um, you know, they still were able to see us coming through. They started shooting us up. Um, and I remember, you know, I remember moving up to some high ground. Uh, my team got tasked to go move up to some high ground and try to, you know, overwatch or see if we could see it to try to take, take it out. Um, another one of them was hearing on the radio because we were we had a, a comms guy with us that spoke the language and doing radio intercepts so we could listen to all their transmissions and i remember him coming over the radio. it was the eeriest feeling because you're sitting there in this truck on this on this road on the side of a mountain that you can't just turn around on. like right. you're not going anywhere you're going forward or everybody's got to back out of this place and that's even hairier to do right. So we're sitting there and we're stopped at this one location and he chimes on to the, to the radio and he's like, Hey, I'm hearing the chat over the radio. They see us. And then he comes back on about 10 seconds later. And he's like, yeah, they're getting ready to fire an RPG at us. He's like, yeah, they're firing RPG now. I mean, and then you just, you know, you hear this and oh my RPGs flying by and he's calling it over the radio as they're talking to each other saying, talking to talk, you know, their gunner onto our positions and, you know, we're getting all the calls and it's just like, there is nothing we can do right now. We're like, I hope he is a bad shot. Right. Yeah. We're yeah. the sitting ducks. Yeah. And, and to sort of catch people up who, who haven't been in the military or may not be, you know, a military buffs or whatever, or the dish goes is a heavy machine gun. Um, and when, um, when Jamie's talking about blackout lights, talking about basically IR lights that that flood, you know, that, that flood the air with with, you know, the you can the, only see under night vision. Yeah, you can see under night vision, but the thing with the Afghani's is because they didn't live in cities, they didn't have all the light pollution. Their night vision was so good um, that I mean, they. Yeah, and I, I talk about that in my night vision classes too because we you know, we've experienced it. We have all this IR capability and we have IR lasers and we have IR lights and all this stuff. But, you know, there's times in Afghanistan, we're doing like a 10 click walk-in and we, you know, we're trying to be disciplined with all of our lights, but right. we're walking in the middle of nowhere, nothing out there, open desert. And then, you know, you look over and somebody's, you know, shining, shining a, a laser on something, you know, and, and you look over and you're like, okay, yeah, there's a sheep herder or something out here in the middle of nowhere yeah and he's a good 200 300 yards away from us and he's just standing there staring at us i mean it's pitch dark at night yeah you can't see nothing and he's watching us just like it's daylight yeah. so yeah they they don't live in cities they don't have all that light at night you know once the sun goes down that's pretty much it light's done for them so their eyes are are, are so better adapted to the nighttime mm -hmm. um they can see better at night and, and even, you know, a lot of our IR lights and blackout stuff, they can pick up some of it, but, you know, I will say that technology has gotten better. We have gone higher in our frequencies now on the IR stuff just to um, get away from, because it, I'm like a geek out on you a little bit here. Right. So um, the color spectrum red, right. So we see, when we see red, red is the tail end of the visible spectrum. So red runs up to, around 800, really about 840 nanometers um, is where we can still see red. And the IR spectrum, the beginning of the IR spectrum is around that 820 nanometers. So there are a lot of devices that are still using like even LEDs, but they fall in that 840 nanometer range. 
and if you look at them, like some of some of the strobe lights, like IR strobe lights, um, if you turn it on and you just cup it in your hand and you look at it, you'll see like a faint red light glowing. Okay. Now you can see that and you're close to it looking, but if you think somebody at night, pitch dark, better night vision than what we have, just natural night vision, they can see some of that stuff, you know? Uh. And that's, that's one of the products that, you know, I worked with a company called Core Survival and we developed a, a strobe light, the Hellstar 6. And I was adamant about, hey, we need to use 890 nanometer LEDs. And you turn that light on and you can't see anything. I don't care how dark the room is, how close you put it. You're not seeing anything with the naked eye. Very um, you still see it fine under night vision. But yeah, so that, you know, learning points of combat and different situations I've been in and now taking that in my afterlife of helping with some product development stuff and saying, no, you know, this is what we need on the battlefield. You know, the, the Hellstar 6 is a better light. So... So to, to encourage you to geek out a little bit more and satisfy my own curiosity, um, and I know that night vision has is, is advanced a lot uh, since, you know, the, the late 2000s and whatnot, but, or, but why, was, why was night vision green? If, if we're talking about beyond red, why, was, why did we see the world in green? So the original phosphor screen, so it's, it's the phosphor screen in, in the tube that makes it green and or white. Um, originally, green came about because, and now we're, we're actually seeing this again with green, um, uh, green optics, like the, the red dots and stuff, and green lasers. So green is 550 nanometers. That is the very middle of the spectrum of light that the human eye can see. So green is is generally easier for the human eye to pick up because it's right there dead center in the middle. So the uh, original thought as I know it, and I could be wrong, um, but the original thought that I know they made the phosphor screen, one of the reasons was that. Um, just, hey, thinking, oh, the human eye could see this better. It might be you know, better for the human eye at night now putting this device on to be able to see. But now we have learned since going to white, that white allows the tube to be brighter. It allows for better contrast. White is is definitely predominantly better than the green because we can see a lot more. And of course, the technology's gotten so much better with the FOM ratings for the figure of merit. You know how they rate a tube. Um, the clarity on them is is unbelievable now. So going to that white, having a higher contrast, having more light come into the tube now with thin filmed and filmless tubes. Uh, yeah, it's the white is just absolutely amazing now. Does I've never looked through white, uh, you know, uh, night vision. Does the green felt warm? Like you could wear it night after night after night for hours, and it never felt like once you got used to it, it never felt like your eyes fatigued. Does, does white does white still have that sense of where it doesn't fatigue your eyes? Yeah, actually, white is better. On really? The eyes. Um, yeah, because it's just that it's that gray scale. You know, the I, I, the human eye, I believe, is is just um, it's easier on the eye. Um, you just have more of that black and white picture. Um, you know, gray scale, so it is. It's easier, and I don't, you know, I don't notice any issues. I mean, I still spend quite a bit of time under night vision now. Um, so yeah, um, I, the white is just all around better for your eyes. It's better picture, better quality. Um, definitely. I mean, all the militaries move into white with, with everything that they have, you know, we were running white in special operations for quite a while. Um, but yeah, now the most, all the services and everybody's going to white. And Amazing how, yeah. how far the technology is. It come. really is. Yeah. yeah. It really Since, is. You know, uh, Jamie, you probably had the PVS sevens and Ranger battalion back in the day. Sure did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Yep. Uh, so, oh, yeah. yeah, different world nowadays. Um, back to Tora Bora, you guys did uh, make it through those mountain passes, and, and thankfully the RPG guys, uh, the Rocket Men, were not uh, quite as accurate as they wanted to be. Um, what, what was the rest of that operation like when you got up there? I mean, you're trying to vector in on where presumably Bin Laden is. Yeah, so we're still gathering intel, getting intel sent to us, you know, trying to pinpoint exactly his location and make our way there. But a majority of it was just fire missions. You know, we had mm -hmm. at one point, I mean, I want to say like 12 aircraft stacked and it was continual. I mean, it was like there were there were pilots that got in the stack, 
waited, 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 dropped their munitions, would fly all the way back to like Spain. Or, I mean, there were pilots coming in from all over the world. They would fly back, get refitted, and then come back and get in the stack again. Wow. Um, so it was continual, continual bombing. Like we did not let up, did not stop until we were told to. And then that's a whole <laughs> deal with how UBL got out and blah, blah, blah. But yeah. And, and, and that's, was, what's, that's what's behind you on the background, is it right? Is a shot of Tora Bora. Yep. That is a shot of Tora Bora. That is uh, yep, one of the runs that we did. Um, I think those were a bunch of uh, 500 pounders um, dropping in there at the same time. Yeah, so you continue it. Night nighttime was pretty cool though because um, all you had to do was look out on the other mountain ranges and look for the fires, and it was like, oh, there's the bad guys, and you just laze it and call in the fire mission and drop bombs on fires. Yeah, it was it was pretty easy. And so you're you're produ- you know, at this point, softening the enemy up with all these airstrikes. But you you had mentioned that your team was also designated to go and clear caves. <laughs> Yeah, so we we were tasked with that, and we were tasked with taking lead on the cave when we got there to Bin Laden um, and going in and, and clearing that you know that cave right, particularly. And you know, we didn't run into a bunch of caves up in there. I mean, we covered a lot of terrain. We got you know over eight thousand feet um, while we were there, and we got close to Bin Laden. Um, but yeah, we didn't run into a bunch. I mean, there were some that we did run into, but. You know, I, I didn't see any crazy elaborate caves, you know, like we read about where they're, you know, you yeah. can drop a truck in them and they're so far deep and all this. I mean, most of them, because they're up there dug by hand. Now, they were elaborate for some hand dug caves, um, you know, and they had like little L turns into them going into them. So, you know, they knew, hey, if somebody drops a bomb at the entrance of this cave, we could survive this. Like it's not the shrapnel, everything's not going to come directly in. So they had turns in there. Um, their camouflaging was great. I mean, these guys lived up there. You know, they fought wars for years up there. They knew what they were doing, and and you could see it. Um, it was it was you know somewhat impressive uh, as we moved through to see what we saw and how they were working and how they were you know living up there. It was, how, it was elaborate. How, how deep would you say like the main cave or some of the bigger caves were um, that you went into? I mean, could they have been cleared with like? thermal barracks or did you have to oh, go yeah. into them yeah 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 oh yeah easily yep yeah they, they weren't they weren't very big or, or very deep at all yeah from the ones that we saw yep they could have been cleared easily with thermal barrack or even one you know one grenade or something and you know going in there was the entrance was small and you know one one man kind of trying to get in there and um and do what you had to do but yeah it was uh it, it, it was neat i mean that, that terrain was 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 rocky and you know you could see where they had to chip away at it and i mean i couldn't even tell you how long some of those caves have been up there i guarantee you from the 80s you know some, yeah some were still there do you want to talk about that uh the actual operation where you guys were trying where you did get close to bin laden i know as you mentioned uh tom mentions it in his book which we have over here somewhere um oh, cool but yeah if, yeah if you want to talk about that a little bit i'd love to hear about well, it yeah, I mean, what had happened that I knew of, you know, from from what I knew, again, I'm kind of nobody still, right? I'm still just trying to keep my mouth shut and, and not get fired in my first you know, year <laughs> or six months on a team. Um, we had gotten the intel, you know, kind of knowing where he was. We were continually to hammer and drop bombs on the cave system that, you know, where we knew we, he was. And we had actually heard over the radio that he had been injured um, in one of the bombing runs or something. So I think they're, you know, they were scrambling. They knew, hey, we were getting pretty damn close and they wanted to get him out of there. Um, from what I know of it, they, they, I don't know who the hell they called or how they got the word, but, you know, they asked for a ceasefire. They had basically said, probably through some of their sources or whatever, um, or sent some guys down and said, hey, we're going to give up, like, just stop the bombing so that we can come out. And they had, I think they gave us a number that I had heard was something like 2,000 soldiers or something. I honestly don't even think there was 2,000 soldiers up in that whole mountain range. Um, but they had said, oh, we got 2,000 fighters, you know, they're going to they're gonna give up, we're going to walk down through the, you know, right here through the main valley and, and come down to the base and, you know, they're giving up, they're giving up, we just, you know, we need to cease fire. Uh, so, of course, you know, way, way above me decided, all right, you know, hey, two hours of a ceasefire, so no bombing, no nothing. 
Right. And that's when UBL snuck out the backside um, of the mountain range there into Pakistan and gone. Right. So, I mean, right at the two hour mark, you, this is me, fire mission over. Um, I mean, we started right back up, but at that point, I mean, it took a little while for us to learn like, hey, we're not hearing him on the radio anymore. Right. You know, or nobody's talking, there's no chatter. Like, it's, this is a dry hole. You know, the fish, the fish have left this spot, they <laughs> moved somewhere else. Yeah, it's unbelievably frustrating. And I mean, it really comes through in, in Tom's book as well, just the, the frustration with that entire mission. Yeah, it, it was. It was very frustrating. And, and I would say it was, it was a goal of his on our next rotation, which was, again, in you know the wintertime. That was a fun back-to-back Christmas rotations. Um, but, yeah, when we went right back in there, he, I would say he didn't sleep like the whole time we were back home. And all he did was work the intel and figure out how he got out, who helped him get out. And that was his mission when we went back there was to go get that dude. And we did, it was a, that was a pretty elaborate mission to get in there to get the dude that we did. Cause we hung it out there and we, we went through bad guy territory in the middle of the day um, to get in there and, and walk a long ways to up to this guy's house. But um, yeah, we rolled in there and grabbed that dude in the middle of the night. And uh, I think Tom was, was, was pretty happy. Um, that we got to do that. It's it's kind of interesting because I mean McCudell Sauter and others have always played that timeout game with us and and relied on our sense of fair play. It's sort of like when when somebody says uncle I give up, I give up and then they start fighting yeah. again as soon as you let them up. But um it's kind of interesting that I don't know if it was a gamble on their part or if they just sort of knew that Americans would be like okay cool like we'll stop bombing you come on out. And yeah, I don't, I don't, I mean, they probably played that game with the Soviets, you know, um, that would be my guess. I mean, it seems like it's some, some old cartoon Looney Tunes cartoon idea from way back in the day, but yeah. they, they gambled, tried it again and you know, it, it worked. So yeah. there's yeah. nothing we could do about it. I mean, obviously we were very frustrated, you know, we, our mission was to go there and to go get them and, and we were ready to do that, but it didn't, didn't work out for us. And, you know, unfortunately it took a long time. So, you know, we were finally able to go get them or the seals were, but yeah, yeah, just glad we did another 10 years. Yeah. Completely insane. (laughs) Oh, I know it it is. Wow, man. So you said you, the, the next rotation was back to Afghanistan uh, where you grabbed up that one guy back again in the winter. Yeah, so we went because what we were doing at that point is we were rotating with Dev Group, so um, it was us and in, in SEAL Team Six. So they would go, and then one of our squadrons would go, and then one of theirs would go, and then one of ours would go. So it was longer between rotations initially, just you know.